I mean, who knows what your business is going to look like two years from now? I mean, Netflix, as an example, was still sending CDs, movies in an envelope to subscribers five or six years ago, right? And I mean, yeah. now their business is totally different. This is Super Fast Business with James Schramko. James Schramko. Helping you build your business super fast. 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 James Schramko here. Welcome to superfastbusiness.com. Today, I'm having a chat with John Warrillo, who has just published a book called The Automatic Customer, Creating a Subscription Business in Any Industry. Welcome, John. Thanks for having me. I loved your last book, Built to Sell, the last one I saw anyway. I'm not sure how many books you have, but that was such a phenomenal book in terms of uh, package services, which was right up my alley at the time. And... You mentioned in this most recent book that you'd wish you'd dedicated more of that book to the subscription model. Why is that? You know, my day job is running something called the Value Builder System. And so we help businesses improve the value of their company. And we see thousands of businesses. Last checked, I think we had 14,000 businesses that we'd gone through the system. And one of the things we found is that recurring revenue is a huge driver of the value of a company. And in Built to Sell, I talked about you know, I talked about packaging a service and productizing a service and picking one thing and not getting, but really, you know, recurring revenue was something I gave a bit short shrift to. And so I figured, you know, I better write that wrong and, and uh, dedicate a whole book to this notion of recurring revenue. Because when you, I mean, if, if an acquirer is going to view your business as valuable, they've got to see where the revenue is going to come from when you step away. Right. So it's a very powerful factor if you want to sell a business. What other reasons would there be for having recurring revenue? Well, I mean, it smooths out your demand flow. Obviously, you can start predicting your business a lot more carefully. If you have inventory, it allows you to really start to to, to you know make sure you've got enough inventory, not too much inventory. It typically proves the lifetime value of a customer. I mean, I wrote about it in the book. This 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 business called H Bloom is fascinating. These guys do. Uh, subscription-based flowers. So instead of selling flowers to the guy on the way home from work, they sell flowers to uh, spas and restaurants and hotels that want fresh-cut flowers. And and so they sell them on a subscription. Every two weeks, get fresh-cut flowers on your on your desk. The average lifetime value of an H Bloom subscriber is something like four grand. And you compare that to the average guy who walks in and buys a bouquet once or twice a year. So it it improves the the you know the value of your customer tremendously. So are there any businesses that you don't think would suit the subscription model? You know, I think everybody, when they hear the subscription model, they think, oh, that's, yeah, sure, that's for software companies, um, that's for media companies. And then they sort of stop and say, but, you know, I don't think this really could apply to, to my business. And, and part of the goal of the book is to say, actually, hang on a minute, you know, you could create a subscription in virtually any business in any industry. I mean, i give you an example. There's one of the nine subscription models I talk about in the, in the book is called front of the line. And front of the line refers to the idea that people will pay to jump the queue. You know, we, we pay to buy a fast pass at Disney. We pay for special access to highway lanes. You know, we're, we're becoming much more comfortable with this notion of paying to play. And so if you've got customers, by definition, you could create a subscription model where they pay for a kind of 911 or 999 level concierge level service. And this, you know, the software guys have nailed this. Adobe, Salesforce.com, they've been charging for, you know, service subscriptions for you know, decades, long before they started selling software subscriptions, especially in the case of Adobe. But you can do that for law firms, accounting firms, you know, online companies, the, the gamut. As long as you have customers, you could – I mean, that's one of the nine models you can apply. Right. I like that one. So let's talk about a couple of the other membership models. I think we've established that a subscription model is a good model to have if you want to have a high value for your business, if you want to smooth out revenue, if you want to increase the lifetime customer value. So what are some of the others? Let's just, let's pick three models perhaps. You've taught us the front of the line model. Um, Let's think about an online business because that's where most of our audience are. Yeah, I mean, the classic would be the membership website where you you pay for access to special content. So uh, obviously, your business would probably fall into this in this space. One of my favorite examples would be the Wood Whisperer, where they teach uh, hobby uh, woodworkers how to do 
uh, woodworking, how to create your first cabinet, your first, you know, first credenza, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it's the videos and online communities that make those, those tend to work. And what I think is interesting and a particular opportunity right now is that increasingly we are comfortable now paying for content online. You know, there was a time maybe 10 years ago where everyone thought, inter- you know, information should be free. Right. And, and no one was willing to pay for information online. And what happened was editorial budgets got slashed. And we all realized collectively that, hey, wait a minute, actually, it makes sense to pay for editorial. I mean, we don't go to a restaurant and expect not to pay. We don't go to you know theater and expect not to pay. I mean, it's, it's natural to pay for editorial. And so you see the New York Times now has over a million subscribers, WSJ, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, all have you know, millions of paid subscribers now. And that's actually opening the door for these little membership websites because all of a sudden we're willing to pull out our credit card for, you know, mission critical information. Nice. So there's obviously a whole range of questions around the membership website, how to, you know, what to put in it. The biggest question I get is, you know, how much content do you have to start with and all this sort of stuff? And then there's how you sell it. We might come back around to that. You've talked about the membership website. What are some of the other ones? For example, I do uh, recurring services online with our traffic services. And I know that a friend of mine does this with website development. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's one of the simplest subscription models that can apply to virtually any business. And that is that uh, one's called it's called the simplifier model. And basically what it does is it is it says to a customer, look, you're way too busy to keep hiring me back. We all know that I do a good job and you like the service that we provide. Let's just set up a recurring agreement that says that, look, we're going to do these five things for you every month. You can stop us at any time, but we're going to continue to do these until you do that. So for example, there are companies that will help you do search engine optimization. And they'll say, instead of, you know, you're doing it on a project basis, they'll say, look, we'll do all your SEO work. Uh, we'll make sure you're number one and number two in Google for your keywords. And we'll do that, you know, for a year. And then at the end of the year, you can let us know if you want to continue. We're going to, you know, we're going to assume you want to continue. And so that's just taking a service, in this case, search engine optimization, and 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 making it available on, on a subscription basis. Search engine marketing works the same way. Website development. I mean, it really what you're, you know, the difference between a transaction versus a subscription is that the customer is agreeing to continue on, you know, in perpetuity until they say stop. And that's the key difference. And of course, that means that you as, as the provider of those services don't need to resell it you know it's the it's the sale that kind of keeps on giving if you will yeah that's why i'm a fan you sell once and you keep delivering and you know just to to really put a spotlight on that the thing that i think makes it really work as long as you keep delivering value is that actually requires effort for someone to stop it something has to happen and a lot of people have resistance to you know, taking an action that will stop a, a rolling stone or that that uh, momentum. You're right. As long as you keep delivering, you know that's same. Obviously, any product you sell on subscription, whether it's vitamins or websites, should be good quality, right? Absolutely. I mean, you're never going to wait get away with having bad quality, but but once you get beyond that, there is that inertia that kicks in. One of the other things we saw in doing the research for this book is that a lot of times. Uh, people will will continue to subscribe for fear of losing their data. So, you know, if you've got, for example, something like a HubSpot, a search, you know, a, a all-in-one kind of marketing platform like Infusionsoft, well, you've got reams of data about response levels to email campaigns, response level to social media campaigns. Sure, you could go from HubSpot and cancel and go to Infusionsoft, but the question then becomes, well, like, what happens to all my data? You know, you could leave AWeber and go to Constant Contact as an email provider. Sure, great, but what happens to all my data? So, you know, one of the little hidden secrets of of retaining subscribers is to make sure that you say, look, you know, we're going to keep your data here forever, provided you continue to subscribe. So, you're talking about what might be called pain of disconnect. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's exactly right. Yeah, so if my internet connection stopped, that would be annoying. <laughs> and I'd do whatever it takes to get it back on quickly. That's the kind of thing you want. Uh, so it's it's where people will miss it tremendously if it's not there. Yeah, and, and you know who's doing a really terrible job of this is Microsoft. Microsoft uh, Office 365 is their you know big, bold step into the, the subscription economy, but they're half pregnant. They're continuing to sell it mostly through their partners. And in an effort not to alienate their 
partner community, they're, they're not directly creating a relationship with their subscribers and they're asking their partners in many cases to renew the, you know, the, the, the Office 365 relationship at the renewal date. And it's just a mess because once you subscribe to Office 365 and you're running you know, PowerPoint, Microsoft Word, Excel, like the key kind of suite most people run on, you don't want to have to pick up the phone and call someone and say, oh, yes, I'd like to resubscribe or continue to subscribe. You know, if it's a mission-critical software like that, you just want them to know that, hey, listen, I'll let you know if I don't want to subscribe, but don't interrupt my service. And Microsoft right now is really fumbling the ball trying to figure that out. So you could actually help someone more by having them go onto a recurring plan than to have to stop, start, and stop, start, You know, where we might have a fear of asking someone to subscribe uh, perhaps, and, and we have to think of it in ways that it's actually more helpful to the customer to have disc, you know, the, this um, – seamless delivery of service on the ongoing agreement. You bet. And I mean, you bet. I think that's right. I think you need to think about what, you know, what are the benefits, you know, one of the benefits of Microsoft Office 365 to come back to them. And one of the things they're doing, I think a good job of, you know, is downloading patches and security patches immediately, right? So if you subscribe to Office 365 and they find out about a virus, they've got a patch in hours. Whereas if you are doing it old school and you're, you know, getting CDs and, and you're loading them up on your your hard drive, clearly those are outdated uh, and you're going to have to rely on third party um, virus protection software. But you know, Microsoft. So that's part of the value proposition. You're getting real time updates to the you, you know patches and so forth. Another example of that, to go back to an earlier point, James, is, is at H. Bloom as an example, the, the flower guys that do flowers on subscription. I mean, one of the benefits of subscribing to flowers is that H. Bloom knows who you are, knows what flowers you like, and knows months in advance of what your order is. That enables H. Bloom to actually buy directly from farmers, not how – flower stores typically buy, which is through wholesalers and, and distributors and so forth. And so when H. Bloom buys flowers, they buy them direct from the farmer with two days. They're at their subscriber's doorstep. The net result is that the flowers are two weeks fresher and last two weeks longer for the subscriber. And so when H. Bloom goes out and talks about the value proposition of subscribing, that's a big part of their sales pitch. It's, hey, you, know, you get flowers two weeks faster, which means they last two weeks longer. And if you're a, a you know a spa or a restaurant or a hotel, that's money in your in, in your wallet. You know, not having to replenish fresh cut flowers uh, more frequently. So, uh, you know, I think it's I think you've hit on a really good point. Selling a subscription, you've got I mean, you've got to make the case as to why subscribe, right? Yeah, well, I'm really relating to what you're talking about because when we were really growing with our SEO service, we had trigger points whenever we took on X number of customers for particular recurring packages that would start an HR recruitment process. And when you're hiring people, that's one thing you don't want to mess around with. You want to be able to make sure you can provide sustained employment. But we knew that a customer would stay X number of months and that we would need that manpower. Now, I want to go back to another comment you said before, which was the the half-pregnant approach to marketing. Here's something I really want to dig in on. I've seen people when they change from selling one-time products to subscription have a lot of hesitation about not selling a front-end product. It's like they've gone from having the customer be able to nibble away at low-end products because most internet marketing educators are talking about the Ascension model. They say a free report to a small product to a back-end recurring to a high-ticket item. And I teach the chocolate wheel, which is, hey, someone might want to come straight to your high-level marketing and not need to go through the free report, the small product, the recurring thing. So I've made all of my products accessible. There was this one point where I actually cut off all my front-end products, which significantly streamlined our marketing. It made everything much easier. We just put it all into one pot and had this huge front end of blog posts and podcasts feeding the membership. So really it was now uh, what my old boss used to call, and forgive me if it's too crass, he used to say, piss or get off the pot. You're either in or you're out. And it's this, hmm. customers now had this decision whether they wanted to you know, be part of it or not, but there was no easy option because I found sometimes it was quite hard to convert people from a low product to a subscription back end if you gave them a stepping stone. I'd love to know if you've had some experiences around this sort of challenge that people go through. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think you've nailed it uh, really well. I mean, you can have that graduated, you know, free offer, very low cost offer, subscription offer, high end offer, and and everyone from Tony Robbins to you know uh, all, all the kind of big you know, sort of content marketers have have done that. And I think that's that's a, a successful model. But equally successful is what what I would call kind of giving people the ultimatum. And which is, is look, you know, we believe in our subscription offering. We think we provide tremendous off, you know, opportunities for the people who subscribe. And, and therefore, you can't just kind of nibble away at the edges. You can't taste test it. You're either you're in or you're out. And so that takes enormous courage. You've obviously got to have a, a tremendous value proposition. But what it really needs, I think, to, to give people the ultimatum is some level of exclusivity. So you can, you can, legitimately look the eye of the customer either through the computer or directly and say look you know we only have nine spots available and and that's you know that's why you know it, it's the ultimatum you, you can't it's not always going to be available we're only doing this in you know in for, for this group in this city for this limited amount of time so i think you you really not need to to have some scarcity associated with those sorts of offers where you have an ultimatum I think I think that I think that bolsters your value proposition tremendously. I think deadlines and scarcity are wonderful tools. I uh, found also coupons can work particularly well at the right uh, part of a sales funnel. Mm-hmm. One little segue we had was to offer people a bonus incentive if they purchased an affiliate product through us, and inside their bonus gift was a recommendation to join a membership with a coupon that could be redeemed. And uh, that was a nice little way to segue people through. But it it was uh, it, it does take a lot of courage to turn off a productive front end to let people, you know. But but I, in my product philosophy was that I'd rather be able to coach people through a product they're consuming rather than just to buy it, download it onto their hard drive, and never look at it again, which is a very common behavior of online, edu- you know, education people. Feel and they've purchased something that they've got the benefit of it straight away. It's like buying a Kindle and never reading it. Right. And I wanted to be able to uh, help them. I wanted to be able to answer their questions and encourage them to take action and make progress through that. So it was almost a creative uh, requirement of mine to to help people get better results for themselves and and almost to make it not so easy on them. It's like instead of doing three little skipping exercises every morning, I'd send them to boot camp, but they get much better results. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. I I just, I, you know, maybe it's my personality or whatever, but I I can't, I I feel like I've got to be building something. I can't just be running on the kind of hamster wheel of, hey, we've got this new product and we're going to get a hundred people to buy it. And then we've got, you know, this other product and we're going to get 10 of the hundred to buy that. But, but all, all the time, you're just kind of spinning your wheels, trying to kind of get to the next launch, the next product launch, the next exciting thing, the next shiny ball, so to speak. And you, five years goes by, and, and maybe you've built yourself a decent lifestyle, but you haven't built any equity. You haven't built anything you could sell. You're just one step away from, you know, you've got to continue to reinvent yourself. Whereas if you've built, you know, 500, 1,000, 2,000 subscribers who are paying you, you know, a regular fee for access to your information, I mean, that's a business that you could bring in a manager to run. You could you could sell it. You could you know, partner with someone and take half the equity off the table. I mean, there's real value in that recurring revenue. But if all you're just doing is you're know, coming up with the next big product and having a launch and getting a bunch of people to buy it, it may spike your bank account, but it does it does nothing to create any long term equity. Well, you also uh, you know this is such a such a topical thing, so it's worth digging in on a little bit because in our market, this launch syndrome is just this the the annual relaunch of the big major products. But there's a lot of fatigue involved. It's the energy from the person putting it together. There's a lot of stress on the market. There's huge refunds. There's affiliate payouts, competitions, inboxes get exploded. Uh, it it's no way to run a business, and I'm totally with you. I love having a recurring rent roll coming in without the need to have affiliates or launches or uh, the song and the dance. It just keeps coming in, and the services in particular can be management run. And if you have a nice front to it, if you, you say content marketing, which is my choice, it can be a very nice railway track to roll that engine down smooth and easy no pain. So let's talk just a little more on selling a subscription model. 
let's say we've listened to this. We, we think, oh, John, this is fantastic. I want to smooth out my revenue. I want a high lifetime value. I, I'm going to commit to, to having, helping people more and letting them continue to get my fantastic service. They're, they're ready to pay to play. Um, how do I get about selling this model? Is it just a traditional sales page? Is it piggybacking something else? So there's some little dials or buttons we should push to make it work easier? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a subscription, you think of the analogy of a marriage. It, it, it's, you know, a transaction, you're going to an event, buying a, you know, a special report on XYZ. That's like a one night stand. You go to the bar, you guys both have a good time, and, and there's no commitment after the fact, right? Whereas a subscription, you are having a romantic relationship and you, and you become engaged and ultimately married to that company, meaning you, you, you give up a little bit of freedom, but you also hope that you get much more in return for that, you know, a loyal, committed relationship experience. Cetera, and the benefits of that. And so with a subscription, you're, you're really, you're selling a, a much longer term relationship. So I think it's, it's worth going into that with, that with that philosophy. The other point I think I would make sort of philosophically is that nobody's going to subscribe to your service uh, to save 10%. So, you know, if they can look at your product lineup and say, okay, I can go to his event for a thousand bucks, I can buy the white paper for a hundred bucks, well, that's eleven hundred bucks, or I could subscribe and it's going to cost me nine hundred and basically I get the same stuff. They're never going to subscribe. They're always going to choose freedom over over the subscription um, if it's just to save 10 or 15%. What I would encourage you to think about is to try to develop a value proposition that is 10x better than the transaction. So a good example of that is, is guys over in California called the New Masters Academy. And what they do is, is they specialize in helping people learn how to do uh, art, learn how to um, you know, watercolor painting or pottery or whatever art uh, you're into. And, and they charge 30 bucks a month for a subscription. And you can log in and then download as many of the, their tutorials as you want. The competitive set for New Masters Academy, if you want to learn how to become a pottery expert – you have to go to a community college and spend, call it six or eight hundred bucks to have to go to you know a community college and learn the same skills as you can learn at New Masters for thirty dollars a month. That starts to look like a ten x value proposition. So, I think you're trying to find a way to to make a case that it's it's literally ten times more beneficial to subscribe than it would be to buy the same stuff on a one off basis. So, in a simple way of looking at it, might be to think of a monthly subscription almost like a part payment plan on what the annual total might look like. You could certainly do that. Yeah, you could certainly do that. You, you know, again, what you want to make the case is, is just, it, it's so much more value. I mean, we, when we think about Netflix, it's just you know, so much more content and value than, you know, downloading individual TV shows or, or movies off of iTunes. There's, there's, again, this kind of 10x value proposition. Yeah, so a lot of people are sort of how, – how do you calculate the difference between a one-time product? Let's say we're an info marketer and we sell a $1,000 thud factor box, a one-time hit. How do we price that as a recurring subscription? Because I had a, had a question about this on my blog, which kind of made me smile. Uh, I was publishing information about the recurring business model because I'm really a believer in it. And the lady mentioned that she sells three out of four people for a three thousand nine hundred dollar program or a nineteen hundred ninety seven dollar program. She can do one to three sales an hour for her six figure business. And she says, now if I do a nineteen ninety five per month subscription and have to provide new content each month to them, calculating the attrition rate, she need a heck of a lot of subscribers. And uh, I said to her, well, a $3,900 program customer is not a $19.95 per month customer. It's probably a $399 or $799 customer. You know, how do you calculate the appropriate monthly subscription if you want to convert from one time to subscription? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I think what you want to do is try to project out your churn rate, which will allow you to establish your lifetime value of a customer. So one quick piece of math that's very easy for people to figure out is, is if you're trying to figure out how long the average customer is going to stay as a subscriber, you could take one and divide it by your churn rate. So it's a, it's a, and you'll get the number of months they stay. So, you know, you could start by estimating your churn rate. And I think 
you know, your churn rate is going to be directly related to how good your content is and how, you know, your entire business model. And to some extent, you've got to get some experience in the market. You've got to get some subscribers to see how long they stay with you. You know, churn rates for mission critical software might be, I mean, mission critical, I'm talking about Office 365 or Salesforce.com. It might be less than 5% a year. Churn rates on online magazines, uh, membership websites, you know, could be as high as 60, 65% annually. So, and again, that, that's going to be driven by how important your information is. So there's a good, a good example of the membership website model being done right, uh, which is called contractorselling.com. And they teach uh, best practices for plumbers and electricians and contractors on how to do sales and marketing and how to build their, their business. Well, that's kind of, when I say mission critical information, that's not uh, you know, just nice to have information. That's information that plumbers and electricians need in order to do a better job. Their churn rate is going to be lower than, you know, uh, somebody who's publishing content about you know, you know, mountain biking excursions in New Zealand. That's a flight of fancy. It's something that's easy to drop in a subscription. Uh, whereas what you're really trying to do is, is get to me mission critical. But the long and short answer is I, I don't have a specific you know, way to do the math. It's not an easy math calculation. But you've got to start experimenting, I think, knowing that, sure, your three grand is a nice little revenue pop, uh, but you basically just got a job. You're not creating any 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 equity in your business if you've got you know if, if if you're just selling these 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 products so if you know it may be better to stay without a subscription if if all you want to do is is create these one off kind of revenue hits but if you want to build a business that's where you've got to have you know recurring revenue from subscribers in my in my opinion do you have a viewpoint on lifetime subscriptions uh, meaning you pay five grand to be a subscriber for life. Yeah, this, look, it's pretty popular in my industry, again, where someone will pay, say, $1,000 or $2,000 for a lifetime subscription. I'll, I'll also say that, like, I don't get it because I think they're creating a very long tail. They would have to extrapolate out, cater for at least, say, two years' worth of service fulfillment. And they're sort of counting that as a one-month income, but I don't think that's accurate. I think they're not amortizing their future commitment. And the more they sell the more expectation that, and capacity that they're committing in the future, and I think it'll catch up on them. Yeah. I've also noticed they can have a, a 40 or 50% refund rate, which seems you know, horrifically high. Yeah. No, I tend to agree with you. I, I don't really get lifetime subscriptions. You know, dynamic businesses, which I think most of the people listening have, fast growth dynamic businesses, I mean, they're going to change so much that it seems a bit misguided to to offer a lifetime subscription where, I mean, who knows what your business is going to look like two years from now. I mean, Netflix, as an example, was still sending CDs, movies, in an envelope to subscribers five or six years ago, right? And I mean, yeah. now their business is totally different, right? So, hey, I, I just don't really get the 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 kind of lifetime subscription. Blockbusters uh, business is really different. Right, yeah, not existing. <laughs> You know the other the other piece of 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 what I think you're missing if you if you offer some a, a lifetime subscription is one of the glorious you know little benefits of getting people to subscribe is you all of a sudden have permission to communicate with them. You have a regular monthly reason to communicate with them, which guess what gives you a regular monthly opportunity to talk to them about the other things that you do, the other subscriptions that you sell. One person who I uh, spoke to who was an advocate of lifetime subscriptions said that that gives you permission to c communicate with them forever because they're always a member and they felt that that was a positive for lifetime subscription. Mm. Uh, however, I'd rather be just communicating with the people who are prepared to pay to play and who value the service. And so I don't want to be communicating with everyone. And even if you go to anyone's email list, a huge section of it will probably be dead where they're not responsive or they've opted out. And I know Facebook last week removed a ton of likes from dead Facebook accounts. Right. And it just sort of pulled back the veil on what was really going on with um, with active users. 
in the book, we talk about recency and frequency and the idea that you are most likely the people who are going to buy your subscription are the bought, are the people that have bought most recently from you and most frequently from you. Uh, those are always going to be the people that are going to buy your subscription first. So, you know, if you've got someone on your email list that opted in seven years ago and has some Hotmail account, well, chances are the email is probably not a, a, a good account anymore. But even if it is, the chances <laughs> of them, them buying from you is, is much lower than someone who is, for example, opted in the last three months. So recency frequency. Yeah, I, I see it. Things like open rates on the weekly news emails and stuff are just off the Richter scale, uh, and you know the welcome and onboarding sequences very very high. When someone's paid to belong, they're really interested in getting the information. You know, I was just gonna say you mentioned onboarding, and and I think that is one of the one of the the real what should I say the, the real the art of running a subscription company is how do you get, because I think you know that in the first 90 days, you have the opportunity to really affect change on your subscriber. So if they subscribe, you've got that 90 day window where there's a halo effect with you and, and, and you have the opportunity to define how they think of you in their minds. But once that 90 day window closes, whatever they think of you, however they're using your service is likely how they will use it forever. And so, you know, we know that getting things sticky, subscription sticky, is getting them to use lots of different things within your subscription offering. But you've got that very short 90-day window to do it. And so sequencing of emails and videos and, you know, webinars and face-to-face -face and all the things that you would, you would try to choreograph to, to make the ideal, most engaged subscriber. I mean, pe there are boardrooms full of people that just do onboarding work at companies like Amazon and HubSpot and Apple and all these huge subscription offerings because they know that it's so, so important to your ultimate lifetime value as a subscriber. Yeah, I agree with you. Having now, I think, seventh year of subscription membership, uh, onboarding is a big one, and weekly news updates, bringing people back in, finding topics that are of interest. If you can keep the engagement, then you keep the subscriber. So let's just cover a couple of mistakes and then we'll wrap up with some action steps. What do you see people doing horribly wrong when they approach this subscription model? Well, I, you know, I think the, the big one is that sense of being half pregnant. In other words, they, they run a subscription model, they try to launch it, uh, but they keep their other business sort of going. And, and I feel passionately about this one because I made this mistake myself. When I, I my last company I ran was a market research company where we provided market research to big companies who wanted to understand the SME market. And so when we first launched a subscription offering, and we launched it, it was similar to what you might get from a Yankee group or a Gartner or an IDC. Uh, we said, look, we're going to package up our research. We're going to publish these reports, and then we're going to give you these reports, and you could subscribe to that. And our best customers for the most part, you know, gave us a meeting. We went to see them. And these would be people like Telstra at Australia, British Telecom in, in the UK, uh, you know, Verizon in the United States, these very large companies. And so we would go in and talk to them and they, they would look politely and nod as we described it. And then they would turn around in the same meeting and say, well, that's nice. We'll think about that. But, but now you're here in the boardroom. Can you, can you tell us about this, you know, our latest new custom project that we want to get done? And they would completely ignore the subscription offering because we continued to offer these two different models, uh, you know, simultaneously. And we got to maybe half a dozen subscribers before I had to turn off the subscription. There just wasn't enough, you know, uptake for us to kind of offer both models. And so I went, you know, back, tail between my legs, spent probably two years running the custom market research company, which was, you know, it, you know, a, a brutal you know business model to run because it was one of those businesses you start every month fresh. You've got no recurring revenue, et cetera. And then the, the second time around, when we tried to run the subscription offering, we did one thing differently, and it made all the difference. And the different thing that we did was we turned off the custom consulting, and we said we believe so strongly in this business model, Telstra, British Telecom, Verizon, that the only way we're going to do business going forward is on subscription. Well, all of a sudden. 
these companies that aren't used to having people tell them what to do, they all of a sudden put their, you know, perch stuff on the end of their chair and wanted to know, well, what's in the subscription? If you're willing to bet our relationship on this, how good is the subscription? How many people subscribe? Where do I get the research? How do I download? All, all the questions changed so they were actually engaged. We got most of our companies to subscribe to what we did. We got lots more subscribers to opt in. And that company was ultimately acquired by a public company in 2008. And again, I, I think the big change was just simply that we actually had the courage to turn off the other stuff. And I imagine their question list was a pretty good checklist for you on what to put in the membership as deliverables. You bet. I mean, the customers are going to help you define. I mean, you go out to the value, you know, the customers with an 80% value proposition, but the, the, the last 20% is something your customer is going to tell you is important to them. Well, we used to sell one thing one time and customers used to say, Could, can we just get that on a subscription so we don't have to keep logging in and buying it? <laughs> that's great. Uh, so, it, it, you know, that's the ultimate customer demand. That's great. So give me one more mistake and then we'll close out with some actions. Yeah, sure. So one more mistake. You know, taking subscribers for granted, I think, would be another one where, you know, you, you get a subscriber and, and you think, okay, the 90-day you know, period is over. You know, we're going to just kind of uh, let it ride and assume they're, they're happy. And, and I think, you know, again, it's a little bit like a marriage. You've got to continue to eject a, a degree of spontaneity. You've got to have date nights. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to continue to sort of feel, you know, show them that you care for them. So a good example of that is the guys over at BarkBox. BarkBox, if you don't know, is a subscription-based company where they send you every 30 days a new box full of treats for your dog. So people who are wild and crazy about their dog can subscribe and get this box of treats. And what they do is they have three headcount, three people that in, work in their New York offices. And all they do every day is drop happiness bombs on their customers. And a happiness bomb is where they scour their customers' blogs and you know, lists and look for reasons to su- surprise them looking for the birthdays of the dog, looking for the birthdays of the subscribers. One example that rings a bell was was, uh, there were two dogs that this one owner had, and one of the dogs died. It was an old dog, and so the other one was severely depressed and moping around the house. And so BarkBox sent them a special box, you know, unrelated to their subscription, and it was a happiness bomb. It was a cheer-me-up example. And so, uh, you know, Thinking of ways to surprise your customers. Amazon is doing this. They've got a, a patent on something they call, uh, I've forgotten what they call it, Pre- preemptive shipping, I think is what they call it, where they look at your you know, behavior and they think about and imagine what you might like to buy next. And they actually, in some cases, put it on the truck to give you a uh, that that product with hopes and that you're going to actually buy it. So you know they're they're trying to think through in advance. Yeah, that's incredible. That they are a very good company too. I remember they delivered me a sack full of copywriting books, and it got lost in shipping. And then uh, they reshipped, and then the original one turned up about eight weeks later. And they just said, "Keep it." And it was, you know, it mm. creates a lot of goodwill. I know what you mean about not taking them for granted. I still go over to London and out to local meetups in Sydney, and and travel to the USA to meet members of my online community offline and to interact with them and we run an annual event each year just as an appreciation and and like the master get together Mm -hmm. and adding an offline element to an online business can be huge it's like uh, when someone joins my highest level program called silver circle they get a little offline package with some things inside it as as a high touch onboarding item that, that bonds as fast as possible that's fantastic John, been great chatting, uh, some really good insights, a few little extra uh, bits and pieces that um, that build on what you've put in that marvelous book. I highly recommend The Automatic Customer. In fact, I also highly recommend Built to Sell. It's still a fantastic book, especially if you're doing any kind of service. Built to Sell will save your life. John Warillo, super expert at all of this stuff. You've got a website called valuebuildersystem.com which is That's what right. you're doing that when you're not writing books, right? That's right. And uh, thank you for coming along and sharing these ideas. Thank you, James. It was a pleasure. So the action step, this is how we close out the show, is to have a look at your business and see what you can pull from this show. And some of the highlights were uh, the idea between not being half pregnant. If you could commit to having a subscription model, then you might enjoy a smoother revenue, higher lifetime customer, 
Uh, you probably find it's easier for you to run a subscription business if you don't take your customers for granted, if you have a great onboarding sequence, and if you start calculating your churn rate, you'll be able to figure out how long people are going to stay. Make sure that people will miss you if they're no longer subscribed and leave it up to them to stop the subscription. And in that case, you should have a nice recurring subscription business. Love it if you could come along and post your comments right where this episode is broadcast on superfastbusiness.com and uh, love to take some of those questions. You've been listening to superfastbusiness.com. I'm James Schramko, and our special guest today was John Warillo, the author of The Automatic Customer. Discover how to build your business super fast. Check out superfastbusiness.com. Thank you.